There are two primary races on the McLean County Board, and one of the board's elder statesmen wants four more years. I may be old, but boy, I've had a lot of experience. That conversation coming up on WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. Good evening, I'm John Norton. Also on today's show, a realtor's group suggests allowing higher density housing will reduce Bloomington Normal's housing shortage. That will solve quite a bit of our issues with housing. Not everything, but at least it will be a good starting point. And today's middle school students will be tomorrow's leaders in renewable energy. The world is open right now. There's so much demand for these skilled trades. It's unbelievable. Those stories follow a Bloomington Normal News update just ahead. This is Sound Ideas on 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR Network. Support for WGLT comes from Bloomington Normal Audiology. Hear My Story continues with local patient Paul Brandt. They're really, really good. I'm just accustomed to having them on. I can watch TV with my wife now and we can set the volume where it's okay for her and it's great for me. Paul's full story can be found at bnaudiology.com. From the campus of Illinois State University in Normal, this is WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. Good evening, I'm John Norton. George Wendt has served the largely rural and very Republican-leaning McLean County Board District 3 for 14 years. In an unusual event, Wendt faces a primary challenge from Brian Leffler, a farmer in the southern and western part of the county. In this interview with WGLT's Charlie Schlinker, George Wendt talks about why he wanted another term. We're in a situation right now where we're tied Republicans and Democrats on a tied board. And with my experience in the past, I think it's a good idea to have somebody that's had a lot of experience with the board to remain and so that's why I've decided to run again. I may be old, but boy, I've had a lot of experience. And well, you're 83? Yes, I guess that's right. Is age an issue? I hope not. I'm, I don't have my thumb on the, the, the nuclear button, so I don't think it's that big a thing. You had some health challenges. You overcame cancer. How is your health? Well, today, my doctor, Sam, a miracle because I'm back to about the same as most people my age. Uh, all my records come back uh, right in the middle of what you should be. And uh, I'm very fortunate there. In your time on the board, what do you count as your, your most significant uh, achievements? Well, <laughs> I have personally worked hard to keep our tax rate the same. And it is the same as when I first went on the board. And when I first went on the board, I got to looking at the budget. And this one year in particular, we had an increase in our income by $1.1 million. And as I'm looking at the budget, they're proposing to spend $1.4 million. Well, I tried to get that changed because I thought, since we had a $1.1 million increase, we should be able to do that without spending $1.4 million. And nobody listened to me, and so I wrote a letter to the editor and explained all of this. And I'll be darned if they didn't call all the committees back and they found that $350,000 that we needed to reduce the budget so that we didn't have to raise the rate. Then every year after that, whenever... The budget would come up, and it was where we were going to have to raise a rate. The first thing I'd ask the uh, administrator, how much do we have to reduce the budget so we can't, don't have to raise the rate? And this went on for several years. You're a noted fiscal hawk. You are, have all this experience you've cited. You are known as a rock-ribbed conservative Republican. Why do you think you're getting a primary opponent at this point? I don't really understand it because obviously uh, I, my district's conservative. And my biggest thing that I would like to have him answer very simply is what votes that I have made would he vote differently? Because I think basically the majority of my constituents, I think, like the, the votes that I have made. 
His announcement of candidacy included statements to the effect that he believes that many people in this rural district don't feel as safe today as when they grew up and that that uh, budget constraints have uh, resulted in uh, slower police response times, slower sheriff's response times. Do you think that's the case? I don't really have gotten that message back from the sheriff's office and how about, I have, how about the mem- the voters in the district well no i have not i have not had any response from the district to that but uh, throughout the th- 14 years that i've been on the board i have supported anything and everything that the sheriff wanted and we we try to in in this uh thing is to keep our sheriff up to date on whatever he needs and that's really why I want to stay on this board, because I want to keep McLean County prosperous and safe. Since you came to McLean County, the the makeup of the board has shifted to a more urban representation than rural representation. How important is your voice to to balance city and rural interests? Well, I think we need... <laughs> What we really need is more Republicans on the board so that we can uh, make sure that our county stays uh, conservative. Uh, whenever the Democrats have gotten control of any county or, or if you notice any city, things get really kind of very liberal and very, they spend an awful lot of money in most, most of the areas that the Democrats are in charge of. Uh, are in financial uh, difficulties and of course McLean County right now we're in good shape and I'd like to see us stay in good shape. It's unlikely though that the county will return to the days of a significant Republican majority. How will you if elected again work to work with Democrats so that the traditional environment of comedy is preserved? Well, as long as they put up things that are positive for the county, uh, I would vote with them. But when it is a negative thing for the county, of course, I'll stand up, even if it's just myself or one or two of us, to at least get out to the public what's going on. This is one of the things that every once in a while, and, and I agree with these people, it, it's somewhat difficult to voice your concerns at the board or at meetings and i think we should kind of open that up a little bit make it easier in in what way i mean there is a public well, comment period on on issues how would that work in a practical sense here's what what i think we should look at see right now you have to apply 24 hours ahead of time and and stuff so i think we should really look at the fact that maybe we could just have people sign up just before uh, our our meeting, like our meetings at 5 o'clock, and if they got there at 4.30 or 5, they could sign up. By the time uh, an issue gets to the full board, though, it's already been through a committee process, and a lot of the the hard work of assessing any policy proposal is done in committee. Um, Should people be going to committees more? Oh, absolutely. If you have an issue and want to address it, yes, your best thing is to address the committee, go to their meetings, but the same rules apply, is that uh, you have to apply uh, so far in advance, where I think we should let up on that and, and, and make it very easy for them to, to, uh, to actually come and talk. That's George Wendt, one of the Republican primary election candidates for McLean County Board District 3. He spoke with WGLT's Charlie Schlinker. The other candidate in that race is farmer Brian Leffler. He has not responded to numerous WGLT requests for an interview. Emmy Award-winning journalist Hala Garani is a Syrian-American, raised around the world, still searching for her identity. I was born here, I was raised there, you know, I speak so many languages, I count in French, I dream in Arabic, I work in English. Garani talks to Morning Edition about that search for belonging, and the way it shaped who she is as a journalist. Tomorrow on Morning Edition from NPR News.
This is Steve Inskeep. Listen to Morning Edition weekdays from 4 to 9 a.m. on WGLT. Sound Ideas is WGLT's news magazine. I'm John Norton. A lot of people are looking to buy a house in Bloomington Normal, but available homes are difficult to come by. Home sales fell nearly 20% of the Twin Cities last year. Bloomington realtor Minu Baskar is president of the Mid-Illinois Realtors Association. She tells WGLT's Eric Stock a limited housing supply and rising interest rates have cooled the market. Baskar says certain types of homes, though, are still selling quickly. We still see that, actually, that number. If the house is priced right and it is in moving ready condition, we are generating offers not in hours, probably a day or two now. Uh in 2022, we were generating like on average listing probably 10 to 12 offers in less than 24 hours. Now that number has gone down, uh, but we are still seeing multiple offer situation. There are a few houses I've noticed has sat on the market for a little longer than what is should have been. And uh, I went and previewed those homes and I realized uh, the condition of the house of those homes were not moving ready conditions. So that has affected them. But other than that, we still have a lot of buyers. Should a home buyer expect to take a home as is at this point? Should they expect to pay in cash? We saw quite a high volume in cash offers in 2021 and 2022. Now that percentage has gone down. But we still have very strong buyers also with 20% down payment and 30% down payment. Uh, I think that is what we are normally seeing. And that is affecting buyers who have only 3% down payment. So the seller, when they make a decision, the listing agent also pay attention to the financing side also of the buyers. So I'm seeing a lot of first time home buyers who don't have a lot of money to put as a down payment are losing in those transactions. How do you address the so-called missing middle, what some refer to as gentle density? Uh, The Realtors Group recently took part in a presentation on that subject. There are so many buyers who are sitting at the edges and they are not being able to move forward and they're losing in transaction because the affordability has become so high and the interest rate is so high it is affecting them. So that missing middle is very, very important place for all of us to focus right now. If we can achieve or target that and achieve that, that will solve quite a bit of our issues with housing. Not everything, but at least it will be a good starting point. It does seem community planners want to see more of this zoning. Many residents, however, don't want it, at least not near where they live. There's perhaps some hesitancy from builders too. There's less profit margin perhaps on each unit. So how do you address that and win the political battle there? Correct. So that is the very big challenge we are going through because when I go and reach out to the developer, I said, why are you not building it? He said, I have a pushback. And those people go to the city council meetings from those subdivision and demand these uh, smaller pricing homes should not be built around our neighborhood. It will drain the value. To me, I think the solution should lie somewhere where we can, first we can convince the city officials and then those city officials, when they will understand how important it is. And if these neighborhood people are approaching them and pushing them not to do that, they should be able to convince them that how important it is for our communities to provide this kind of housing. Time is changing. These home prices, which has gone up, are never going to come down. I think we convince them this is something they need to pay more attention and look deeply into it. As we continue on Sound Ideas with Minu Baskar, a Bloomington realtor who is president of the Mid-Illinois Realtors Association, How frustrating is it to have the customers who are looking to buy, they're contacting you, they they want to move here, and you're either not able to help them or not able to find something in their price range, and maybe you have to turn them away? It happens not a lot, but it does happen now because they think our community provides a very reasonable uh, housing price, affordability, 
which has been changed in last two, three years. But to your surprise, Eric, we are still below average sales price from nationally. So we convince them and we keep making transactions and sales. Going back to the zoning issue, there is a proposal in Springfield that a Chicago area lawmaker has introduced that would require zoning bodies of 100,000 or more residents, so not blooming to normal, but Peoria in Springfield, that would actually ban single-family zoning. What do you make of that proposal? I don't want to answer politically. I'm a very black and white person. (laughs) To me, if there is a need, we all need to come together. It cannot be just the realtor or the developer or the builder or just the city officials. This is a teamwork between starting from the zoning from the city to the developers, convincing the neighborhoods, to the realtors, to the builders. How we can come together instead of putting anybody down because if if one person in this chain is not going to come together, it will take way longer for us to cover this gap or to provide affordable housing. And what do you believe portends for the Bloomington Normal real estate market for 2024? Not only the uh, the lack of housing and homes not being built as fast as uh, certainly you would like, but also the fact that the interest rates uh, rose for a considerable time to try to cool the economy and uh, slow down inflation. Last year in October, Uh, I went for a seminar and I heard that 12 months are going to be very challenging for our real estate industry for many reasons, you know. So in 2024, in 2023, we did see a drop in our numbers, you know, percentage wise, uh, how many units we have sold. Prices have increased, but units are sold less. Right now, what we are struggling is the real challenge. The sellers who wants to sell their home and buy another property are holding on to their homes because they have 3% interest rate. So our job right now has become more to educate our buyer and our sellers. This 3% interest rate is never going to come back, not in the near future. And I don't even know whether it can ever be come back to 3%. To be very frank. Realtor Minu Bhaskar says she expects home sales to pick up in the spring and realtors will be busy again by summer. She spoke with WGLT's Eric Stock. Stories and conversations around Bloomington Normal in McLean County. This is WGLT's Sound Ideas. Close to 75 middle school and high school students from around central Illinois gathered at Heartland Community College. They were at the Challenger Learning Center to experience the world of renewable energy. The students took part in a competition. They designed, built, and tested their own model wind turbines through the Central Illinois Kid Wind Renewable Energy Challenge. Christopher Miller is a Heartland instructor who spoke with WGLT student reporter Eric Dito. Miller says today's students will power the renewable energy industry of tomorrow. He says it's an industry that's rapidly growing. So it's very dynamic and we live in a wonderful community that has a lot of opportunities in a lot of different areas. And so when we have our program here, we want to make sure that we have students ready for all different areas, not just renewable. So while we have a program in renewable, students that come here can be retrained, they can come in and learn new skills, they can move up into higher paying positions, and all that we're really doing is the same foundational skills that will get them ready to come into any one of our industries, such as HVAC, building controls, the electric vehicle environment, the traditional automotive areas, traditional electricians, a traditional trade areas. We're really trying to get ready for how the future is shaping and being ready for that. What's the training look like in a program like this? How, how extensive is it and how, how involved? We really try our best to provide those foundational skills, how to use the tools, how to properly measure electricity safely, how to you know, work with our hands and perform critical troubleshooting on systems that we come across every day from automobiles to heating and cooling systems. So in my little realm of some of the renewables, it's the mechanics, it's the greasing, it's the bearings, it's the fittings on the electrical side, it's solar panels and inverters. So it's 
a mixture of both, but if you know these foundational things in either one of the areas, mechanical or electrical, the world is open right now. There's so much demand for these skilled trades. It's unbelievable. How are you hoping to kind of transfer these skills to younger students who are hoping to learn something practical? Well, what's really interesting right now with the Kid Win comp competition we've got going on, the students are learning gear ratio. We just did a quick little show and tell of our program, and we showed the large wind turbine, and one of my past students, Dakota, was actually showing him what kind of uh, safety harnesses that he wears to climb at wind tower, and one of the safety mechanisms is a six-to-one uh, rescue system. Really what it does is it takes one-sixth the amount of weight to move a person. So from a safety aspect, we're really using a practical application that the wind turbine kids today are using for a gear ratio. So we're talking about different items that make things everyday useful to us. When you look around in an event like this, what are you, what are you thinking? So for a long time it was a challenge, and it's still sort of a challenge to get kids interested in all these really exciting programs. But what's really eye-opening right now is we've got 75 middle school, grade school, junior high students that are all interested in this. And whatever that shapes and takes their future is just incredible. There's so many opportunities, and we've got a great central Illinois community and a, a great foundation of jobs, stability. It's just, it's a great time to be here and a great place to be. What's the, the industry going to be like in 10 years when these students are starting to enter the workforce if they choose to go down that path? My own past experience has, has led me from working in a factory to teaching foundational things to creating a renewable energy program. I would say that if past is any indication of the future, it's going to be in a dynamic, exciting change. Things will become more automated. Things will become, well, more challenging. But the future is all of what we're seeing and how we get there in the transition from wind, solar, or even traditional forms of automotive fixing. It's, it's all going it's going to be great for our kids and great for our community. That was renewable energy instructor Christopher Miller from Heartland Community College speaking with WGLT student reporter Eric Dito. Students from Metcalf School in Normal were among those who participated in the wind turbine competition. Winners were invited to a national kid wind challenge later this year. And that's Sound Ideas today. WGLT's news magazine is made possible in part by Bloomington Normal Audiology. I'm John Norton. Story help today from WGLT's Charlie Schlenker and Eric Stock and from student reporter Eric Dito. Ryan Tui, another one of our talented students, edits Sound Ideas. This is 89.1 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR Network.